We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us and a very warm welcome to the launch of the study of the Internet's technical success factors at the IGF 2021. I'm Joyce Chen and I'm from APNIC, which is the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. Um, so just about this study, it's a new study uh, on the Internet's technical success factors, uh, and it was jointly commissioned by APNIC and LECNIC. So APNIC is the Regional Internet Registry for the Asia Pacific region, and LECNIC is the Regional Internet Registry for the Latin, America, Latin American and Caribbean Internet addresses. After a very difficult evaluation of 14 proposals, we decided to engage Analysis Mason, who are with us today, to conduct this study. We would love to hear your comments and your feedback on some of the study's findings during today's session. First, let's warm up with a quick mentee question. And if you allow me, I will share my screen. Just give me a second. So what I would like you to do is to go to menti.com, that is M-E-N-T-I.com. And then when you're on the page, you can type the code 4217-7963. And what we would like to, you to do is to answer the question, in your own words, how would you describe what has made the internet successful? I would just give a few seconds for people to get into the page. So that is menti.com. And then you can key in the code that you see on the screen, which is 4217-7963. And tell us how would you describe what has made the internet successful? We are starting to have some answers come in. I see people are thinking about the connectivity. 4G is one of them. Of course, we also have 5G, eventually 6G. Some people have pointed out openness that comes out very large. Um, internet content, definitely. Collaboration. Distributed governance, I like that answer very much. I see some people have also put in the protocol CCP IP that has made it easy for people to connect. It is flexible, it is universal. Oh, I see some people have put down resilience uh, or the internet itself is resilient. And in the pandemic, we have seen exactly how resilient it has been. It hasn't disappointed us during this one or two years that we have had to work from home and having to cope with the pandemic. I see some people have said affordable. I think that's very important as well in ensuring that people have access to the internet. And the IGF also has a main session on meaningful access and connectivity that you can look forward to in a different session. So together with distributed governance, I also see multi-stakeholder model. It's interesting that somebody put universal acceptance as well. Uh, there is also another session that will come up in the IGF uh, that talks about universality. And I think universal acceptance will be one of the issues that will be brought up at the main session. So permissionless innovation, I like that very much. And we do hear that quite a fair bit. Without it uh, and without the internet being open the way it is, it would be very hard to see all these new technologies and emerging technologies coming up in the internet. So I see that the answers have started to slow down. 
and I thank you very much for putting some thought into this question. It's just a warm up. Um, and next, it is my pleasure to invite Oscar Robles, CEO of LECNIC, to share his thought on the study. Oscar, please. Thanks, Joyce. And thanks, everyone, for joining us in this session. Let me tell you some of our motivations to make this uh, study. Sometimes uh, we find uh, that the Internet Technical Community members have asked the, uh, themselves, themselves if the internet is fit for its purpose, uh, or if um, uh, this, if the internet of today uh, deviates uh, from its original design. Also, it is not uncommon to listen to other stakeholders criticizing the internet, proposing new network design on the fly, or even suggesting new protocols on the fly, which evolve from one day to another day, fitting everyday findings and critiques from real experts. So we wanted to make this uh, a serious effort to understand the foundations of internet success and make sure not to um, change that. Um, naturally, the first question was uh, whether or not the internet has succeeded. Uh, and the next and most important exercise was to identify what has drive its uh, success, what elements of its design, what protocols, what system, what, is, what, what practices have uh, brought this uh, success. Um, this is the report of the findings. I think, I believe this is a great exercise that needs to be taught to everyone in the internet industry, in the telecom industry, government official regulators, but also we, the internet uh, technical community, to become aware of uh, these elements. To, and to know exactly how it should evolve without compromising its scalability, its flexibility, adaptability, and resilience. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, let's, uh, uh, hopefully it will be a productive uh, study for you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. And next, it's my delight to invite Paul Wilson, Director General of APNIC, to give us his thoughts as well on the study. Paul? Thank you very much, Joyce. Thanks, uh, thanks, Oscar, and thanks to everyone who's who's attending, including, of course, uh, our um, colleagues at Analysis Mason, who uh, we'll hand over to shortly. But um, like Oscar, uh, APNIC approached uh, this uh, this challenge or this opportunity to uh, to get together and to um, conduct a study, conduct an investigation. It's something that we were we were hearing about a lot over the years, and we took took this challenge because I think the the question of the internet's success and what's made it successful is really really important. The um, the question of internet governance has been around for about twenty years. It was about twenty years ago that the multi stakeholder process was kind of discovered, and that internet governance was discovered as an issue that people started to care about. Um, and I think alongside that was a threat that maybe the internet success was a passing thing or that it was under threat, that something something could go wrong, that imp improvements were needed. Uh, but I think we have to remind ourselves that it's been 20 years of astronomical internet growth that has continued while uh, the same discussions have continued uh, and continued in, in quite a few cases. It's not, it's not that common, but in quite a few cases to, to still uh, threaten or to worry that the internet's uh, success could be could be short lasting. So the internet success is, is absolutely non-trivial. It's a, it's a different success than than what we saw 20 years ago, and there are different issues being discussed and raised these days. But it's successful nevertheless. And amid all the changes, uh, we thought it was very important to look at uh, at the internet today and why the internet today continues to be successful? What are the, what are the threads that, uh, that have come through all of these years and that, uh, that mean the internet is successful in spite of all the threats, in spite of all the promised um, issues and problems? Because of course, to change the internet is a, is a big, big uh, enterprise and some fundamental changes are, are proposed from, from time to time that need to be uh, obviously very well um, justified if we're going to take trouble to do them. IPv6, for instance, is something that's been necessary for 20 years and it is happening, but the fact that it's taken so long to deploy IPv6 as a, as a needed improvement to the, to the internet's address, addressing system uh, kind of illustrates that, that changing the internet these days is non-trivial. It, uh, it's a big enterprise, a big ask, and I think we should 
all be sort of very clear on what it is that we're dealing with and what what successes we might be overlooking or not understanding uh, in order to sort of get uh, embark on these sorts of discussions. So the idea the idea of the study, I think, is to throw some really recent findings, some recent thoughts and recent findings to this to this issue, because no doubt the discussions and, and the speculations about the internet and its success and whether the success will continue, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, are going to are going to go on themselves for for as long as the internet itself does. Long answer, but there you are, Joyce. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'll hand you back. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and I do see we have friends from our remote hub in Nigeria. Welcome. It's very good to see there are people who are physically attending the meeting in your remote hubs as well. So now I'll pass the time to Emmon Kavalbein, who is the partner of Analysis Mason, to share their findings on the study. Emmon? Great. I will actually start um, presenting. Uh, my name is Michael Kendi, um, and um, as, as Joyce said, I'm here with my colleague Amin Kvalbein and uh, Julia Alford. Together we'll uh, do this short presentation and take your questions. And we were also joined in the work by David Abacasis, who unfortunately couldn't, couldn't join us for this presentation. Um, so just a kind of a brief introduction. I mean, I think for many the success of the internet is something that's taken for granted uh, just because of the scope and scale and presence in our lives and the resilience and all these factors we're about to talk about. It's something that we may take for granted. Um, so for us, this project was really an excellent opportunity to think deeply about what led to the success, what led to these um, to, to the success that, uh, that Paul and Oscar just uh, described as well and uh, what, what might threaten it in the future. And so we'd really like to thank APNIC and LACNIC for the opportunity to present it. And if you go through the report um, online or there's a short website and, and also a report, and I think uh, Pablo shared the links for that, you'll see that we really had the privilege of uh, interviewing many members of the community, uh, leading members of the community for the report. And we took some quotes and I'd like to thank all of them I noticed uh, Olaf Kochman from ISOC is, is on the call. He was one of the people we interviewed. Uh, I may have missed others who are on this call, but certainly we, we very much valued their, their inputs and participation. Uh, so for now, I'd like to present some of the highlights of the report or start it out. Um, I don't know if you could uh, switch pages. So overall, we identified four dimensions to the internet success that are uh, um, outlined in this, this um, diagram on the left. Uh, the four are that the internet has successfully scaled to the increased demand from new users and usage. Uh, those are kind of the horizontal arrows. Uh, it's been flexible to new network technologies uh, pointing downwards. Uh, it's adapted to new applications. Um, just a huge variety of applications that, uh, that is the upward arrow. And the whole of it has been resilient to the shocks and changes, including adapting to all of our increased usage during this, this pandemic, including today's, today's conference, which we can attend remotely if we weren't able to get to Poland. Um, uh, Julia will go through a little, in a little more detail each of these four points. Um, but overall, they help explain how the internet grew from its roots as a dial-up access network over uh, copper telephone networks to encompassing fiber to the home and 5G and, as Joyce said, 6G in the future, how it's gone from simple communications with text emails to video conferences like this one, and ultimately how it, how it grew from a US-based research and academic network to the global phenomenon that it is today. Uh, next, next slide, please. This, these four dimensions of success that are at the right really grew out of some guiding ideals that led to uh, these design principles in the middle. Um, these guiding ideals on the left were built in by the designers of the internet, the founders, um, and they really shaped the, um, the, tech, the technology, the organization, and the operational development of the internet. Um, 
and I'll just go through these briefly. Um, so the openness, uh, the internet is open in many, many ways, including that it's open when new standards are developed or existing standards are updated. They're open to anyone to participate through the ITF and other standards organizations. Uh, the resulting standards and protocols are open for anyone to adopt um, and, and, and use. It's open to new networks that can join uh, the internet um, and, and, and become part of the, the global internet. Um, the simplicity, the second one, um, the internet is built from very simple protocols. Uh, it wasn't meant, it was meant as a general purpose network, not something to do a specific task, which has enabled it by putting together all of these simple protocols as building blocks to, to um, be able to solve very complex tasks and to continue to evolve and adapt. Uh, and finally, the decentralization. Uh, there's no central authority that owns, operates, or controls the internet. Uh, that's led to the multi-stakeholder model um, that I believe Paul mentioned and, and is clearly one of the, um, the drivers behind the Internet Governance Forum and other ways that, that we get together um, to, to think about the governance of the internet. Um, and those three guiding ideals led to these three uh, design principles in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. And these design principles are the layering at the left, uh, which separates the applications um, from the network, from the networks, um, with the uh, internet protocol as the central stable building block. And sometimes this is portrayed as an hourglass with the applications at the top, the networks at the bottom, and the uh, internet protocol in the middle. And this, this Fundamental design principle has led to the other two principles. Uh, if we go to the bottom there, the network of networks, each network operates independently from the other networks. Um, it allows new networks to, to, to join, as I said. It allows existing networks to adopt new technologies, um, all of it independently from the others, and all of it without permission from anyone to join. Um, and then going to the top, the end-to-end -end principle, um, in which the intelligence of the internet is largely in the end devices at the edge of the network, not in, in the core of the network, meaning that applications can be developed by anyone, uh, made available, and all of us can, can uh, access them or download them and use them without, again, without permission, without changes to the fundamental networks because of the layering principle. And just finally, one strength of all of this is that, um, and we document a few of these, that these principles can be violated without threatening the, uh, the success of the internet, those four success factors. That's another strength. And uh, now I'll turn over to Julia to go into a bit more detail about the four dimensions of success that result from these uh, design principles. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So the first dimension of the internet success is in its ability to scale. So on this slide here, we have a figure generated from ITU and World Bank data, which shows the number of internet users over time split by RIR region and overlaid with the global population. The rapid growth of the internet's user base is clearly visible from an estimated 2.6 billion, 6 million in, 20, in 1990, to 3.9 billion, more than half the global population, a mere 30 years later. This is just one observation of how the internet has scaled, and this growth is ongoing. Even in regions where per capita internet adoption is nearing 100%, there is still exponential growth of the network in terms of the number of devices connected. And you can find more such observations in our report. In particular, we found that remarkably, despite more users, and more traffic per user, resulting from more time spent online and more data intensive applications, connection speeds are increasing. This demonstrates that the internet has scaled in such a way that it not only met growing demand, but improved user experience. The internet's technical architecture, operational and business models each contribute to the scalability. In particular, the layering and end-to-end -end principles that Michael mentioned have allowed networks, applications, and services to scale independently of each other in order to keep up with demand. Additionally, the number of networks and their capacity has had to increase dramatically in order to meet that growing demand. 
and it is the network of networks principle and the openness ideal that has allowed for increased capacity and an interdomain routing system based on the simple BGP algorithm that scales well. Interestingly, we note that the growth in capacity, particularly subsea capacity, is driven by the needs of large internet companies, which offer content and applications and are, who are now themselves investing in supply. With regards to the scalability of the routing system, in the report, we demonstrate this by showing that the average path length stays virtually constant as the internet grows, and that the long-term trend in churn rates does not seem to exceed, exceed the growth in the routing table size. The second dimension of success, examined, is the internet's flexibility. That is, its ability to run over a variety of underlying network technologies. Here, we have an example from Australia. The figure shows the number of internet subscriptions over time, according to the access technology used. We can clearly see the evolution from analog through DSL to mobile and fiber. Despite the wide ranging characteristics of each technology, which make them suitable for varying, varying geographies, econ economies and people, the internet has been able to run over each. That flexibility to accommodate new technologies stems from the layering principle, which separates the routing of traffic from the underlying technology. And the networks of networks principle allows each network to run independently as long as they run IP. The interconnection model also adds flexibility, allowing networks to connect with each other and exchange traffic directly or indirectly. In order to facilitate traffic exchange and make it efficient, internet exchange points have emerged around the world. In our report, we note that IXPs have a generative impact on traffic levels. The average traffic for a member network increases over time, showing how more content is delivered through an IXP as it grows, resulting in increased usage. The ability of the internet to adapt to new applications and usage uses is the third dimension of success. Yes, that one. Here we have two illustrations of how the internet has adapted recently. The increasing popularity of HTTPS on the left, and on the right, the increase and introduction of QUIC. However, the adaptability of the internet is apparent throughout its history, not just in recent years. As the early internet grew, it transformed. It was no longer just a means of accessing computing power and sending files, but communicating and socializing. Over time, the internet has become the primary vehicle for delivering many services that existed long before the internet ever came onto the scene. From voice calls to banking, reading the news to watching movies, grocery shopping to booking hotels, services have converged on the internet and it has adapted accordingly. As it grew, two application platforms emerged over several decades and helped drive the uptake of the internet. The first was the World Wide Web, which emerged in the early 1990s. And the second was mobile app stores, which became popular in the late 2000s. The introduction of these platforms has been a large proponent of the internet's growth and diversification. But the layering and end-to-end -end principles are what are central to supporting this wide range of applications. As requirements have evolved, the end-to-end -end protocols of the transport layer in particular, those that control the flow of traffic has, have evolved accordingly. From a fairly stable protocol mix in the 1990s and 2000s to the more recent changes driven by the widespread adoption of transport layer security, TLS, and end-to-end -end encryption, both of which are evidenced in, by the growth in websites using HTTPS and QUIC, as shown on the screen. Additionally, the general nature of IP allows applications to independently develop innovative offerings. The openness of the internet also means that anyone can innovate and provide new applications and those can be made available to anyone else to adopt. As a result, and in the context of end to, the end-to-end -end principle, applications and protocols in the end systems can treat the internet as a non-discriminatory entity that will move traffic regardless of its content. In our report, we also discuss how the changes in applications over the years and the growing geographical scope of the internet have led to new business models and investments on the part of internet companies providing content and applications in order to help deliver the content. The fourth and final dimension of success is the resilience of the internet. The internet has proven resilient in the face of shocks and changes. Here we present just one observation of that resilience, resilience to increased traffic as a result of the pandemic. 
this plot shows the average international traffic split by RIR region over time. And you can see a clear spike in the growth rate in 2020 as a result of remote working and schooling. Hmm? Yes, that's no. Um, as, yeah, so the spike in growth rate due to the pandemic as a result from remote working, schooling, increased social video calls, and more free time to spend online. And yet, despite this large uptick in demand, the internet continued to operate and offer sufficient service, as further demonstrated in the report, where we show that connection speeds only minutely changed briefly, um, and we have other, other examples as well of how the, the service remained sufficient despite increased demand. The internet has been resilient throughout its history and not just during the pandemic. The very growth of the internet in terms of the number of users and their usage and the emergence of new networks and applications, as discussed previously on previous slides, is in fact an indirect confirmation of resilience. Over the years, concerns have been expressed about the possible collapse of the internet, whether that's due to uncontrolled congestion, the collapse of the interdomain routing system, or a range of security threats, but the internet has stood firm. For example, one thing we discuss in the report is how despite difficulties, the transition from IPv4 to IPv6 is taking place. Um, this is something that Paul mentioned earlier, um, and we show that there is a notable increase in IPv6 usage in recent years. The internet's resilience stems from simplicity and from decentralized operations. So these go back to the guiding ideals. The simplicity of the core protocols, the resilient topology of the internet, and the decentralization of the network of networks have all played important roles in achieving this resilience. Within the network of networks, the entire responsibility for maintaining individual network operation is distributed across individual autonomous operating entities. This distributed responsibility fosters resilience in multiple ways. Diverse equipment, diverse operational practices, practices, and in the fact that planning and decision is making is across all levels. Although an individual network can fail for a number of reasons, cable cuts, security threats, et cetera, the internet topology has evolved in such a way that there is no single central point of failure that can disrupt the whole internet. Finally, as Michael mentioned earlier, the internet has been resilient to violations of the design principles. One such example that we discuss in the report is the fact that DNS essentially bends the layering principle. I will now hand over to Armin to talk through the next slides. Thank you very much, um, Julia. So, so far we've been talking about the success of the internet and there is no doubt um, a uh, lot to talk about. The internet has indeed been very successful. Um, as Oscar mentioned in his introduction, we still hear frequent you know, critiques of the internet or um, people who point out uh, the, 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 the apparent um, lacks of the internet. And there are, of course, also such, um, such things to point out. Uh, and there's no doubt that there are several technical challenges facing the internet also today. Um, in the box here, we, po we point out three of those. We could, uh, could point out more. Um, one such, um, such challenge is uh, security. Security is, of course, a major issue for individual users of the internet, but it is also an issue on kind of a systemic or architectural level, um, perhaps in particular related to DNS, uh, such as uh, DNS spoofing or cache poisoning. Uh, denial of service attacks, uh, but also to routing uh, with, with, with BGP hijacking as one example. Quality of service or the, or the lack of strict service guarantees is a recurring topic throughout the history of the internet. Um, uh, there have been, of course, uh, decades of proposals and attempts to implement quality of service uh, in the internet across different uh, networks and domains. Um, and finally, there's been a lot to talk about the, 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 the inability to, to, to adapt or adopt new uh, protocols, um, as, as has been pointed out several times here. IPv6 is perhaps the prime example of that, where uh, a lack of local incentives has, has made adoption uh, very slow, whereas it's clear that the internet as a whole uh, needs this, um, this uh, change to happen. <clears throat> 
Now, many of these challenges, they are addressed through um, evolution, through different standard bodies who are addressing all of these challenges that we see here. For instance, in the security domain, uh, there's DNSSEC, um, there's DNS over HTTP. Um, uh, for, for, the, for the routing challenges, there is route origin validation, which is now being deployed uh, using RPKI. PKI. Uh, and and, and, and uh, for, for quality of service, there is also, of course, a lot of, um, of work addressing that. Now there's the deterministic networking working group in the IETF who are working on, you know, uh, protocols that will give performance guarantees uh, within networks and also uh, in time across uh, networks. So there is this evolutionary um, path or there is this evolution going on in the internet constantly as there should be. Um, from time to time there are also proposals for more radical changes to the internet architecture, uh, departures from the, um, from the internet as we know it today. Um, such examples historically uh, would include uh, active networking for those who remember that <clears throat> and also uh, named, data named data networking in more, uh, more recent times. Um, of course, um, the internet must continue to evolve to meet uh, these changing demands. Um, and we argue in our report that plasticity or the ability to change and adapt is a part of the reason for the success of the internet. Um, as Paul mentioned earlier, the internet is now embedded in all parts of society. And we believe that a, a fundamental change to the internet architecture uh, will, is difficult to implement in practice uh, as shown by the time it has taken to adopt IPv6 and that uh, a market-driven transition to a, to a radically new architecture is unlikely at this, uh, at this stage. Um, we also believe that, that any attempt to, to force such a transition to a, uh, to a radically different uh, uh, architecture might have uh, unwanted side effects in terms of um, scalability, flexibility, adaptability, and resilience, which is what this report is, is all about. Uh, and as a, as a concluding note here, as the internet develops, we believe it's important to look at what has driven the internet's success so far, and to be careful with changes that uh, break with, uh, with the guiding ideals, uh, openness, simplicity, and decentralization. They have been central to the internet's success so far, uh, and we believe they are still uh, relevant and important. Um, as well as the design principles um, um, that we have highlighted and that, uh, that Julia highlighted for how they drive these different uh, dimensions of success. So with that, we conclude our, our presentation of this report. Um, the report is available as, as has been mentioned and, uh, and there's a link in, in the chat. So um, please have a look and we welcome any feedback and uh, I hand the word back to you, Joyce. Thanks very much, Anne and Julia and Michael, for sharing the findings of the study. We do have one question uh, at the moment, uh, and that's from Marco. I don't know if Marco wants to just take the mic and ask the question. Otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to read it out as well. Yeah. Good day, colleagues. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, it's Marco. I work for the RIPE NCC, full disclosure. Now, I was curious when you showed the slide about sort of the large proportion of international traffic within the RIPE NCC service region, uh, whether uh, you counted the EU internal market as one or whether you still consider the traffic between the 27 member states as international. I was a bit surprised by the, 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 the large equivalent of the RIPE NCC, but then again, given that there is a bunch of small countries in Europe, it makes sense, but only a few. Yeah. So is, is, is the EU counted as one or uh, as, as uh, individual countries? Thank you. Hi, Marco. Um, we did it on a per country basis, so they were counted individually. That, 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 and then it makes uh, a bit more sense why there's such a large chunk. Uh, 
Thanks, Marco, for your question, and thanks, Julia. Um, so I do see in the chat, Fazane says, um, um, these are good technical economic factors for individual protocols, but I think there is a social system angle that might need more attention. Anybody would like to speak to that point? I can, I can address it. Um, thanks for the comment. And I noticed uh, there was an agreement uh, further down. Um, yeah, well, I was just about to say what Paul put into the chat uh, that the study was looking at the technical success factors. Um, we did um, highlight right up top that uh, people drove all of this um, and, and are continuing to um, through all of the contributions at IGF, ITF, all of the various venues and our own personal efforts that there's, a, you know, that there is a lot of personal contribution. Um, but, but as Paul just noted, we did want to focus on the technical success factors. Thanks, Michael. Um, we have a question from Jim, I think, or a comment. Jim? Thanks, Joyce. Um, this is an excellent piece of work, guys, so congratulations for putting this together. Uh, I think you're right in identifying the key technical factors, but I think there's one or two other issues that maybe could have been brought out, teased out a little bit more in the report. Uh, I think, for example, you could maybe say a little bit more about permission as innovation has been one of the drivers for the internet's growth and success factors. The fact that nobody has had to go along and get a license to start Google or to start Facebook or to start eBay, they just did it. I think that's a very important factor in how the internet has grown and become such a successful thing across the world. Um, we've got to realize, of course, that business models have changed and nowadays we've got things like the cloud that we didn't have 20 years ago. And that would have been unthinkable if we didn't have the internet. And finally, we'd also say that the multi-stakeholder model is also a crucial part of the internet success model because everybody who's got a stake in how the internet evolves and becomes successful has got a chance to participate and a chance to be heard. It's not happening behind closed doors in a membership only organization with high barriers to entry. Cheers. I can take that one as well. Uh, I'm gonna see a question further down that uh, that would be great for, for you to address. I mean, we didn't specifically use the word permissionless innovation, um, which among other things was in a kind of a fundamental document from, from ISOC a few years back. Um, but the principle um, exists in several places, the openness of the internet um, and uh, the end-to-end um, -end principle that allows uh, the adaptability of new applications is really where we, we thought about that idea. We didn't specifically mention the companies that you did were able to enter, but the idea that the World Wide Web was able to come in, help drive the growth, as uh, Julia said, and then the app stores and all of the, the, the websites that built on top of that. So we indirectly, I think, uh, address that. Um, and likewise, we, there is a little section on organizational factors that come out of the three guiding ideals um, that includes multi-stakeholder governance um, kind of upfront in section two, and in particular, the decentralization of the lack of ownership really paved the way for um, this multi-stakeholder model because uh, then, you know, there's no one network that controls the internet. There's no one as, that has to give permission. So there's this multi-stakeholder model that, uh, that has taken its place of a particular owner. Uh, so we did cover that and, and we did talk about that a little bit as, as a contributing factor in terms of the organization and uh, development of the internet. Before we get to William, I see your hand is up. Uh, maybe we could have Wim uh, to ask your question that was in the chat, if you would like to take the mic. Sorry, I'm not hearing the sound from the room. Uh, Just one second while we sort out the technical issues. This is the problem when we have a hybrid 
format for the meeting, but I'm so happy to see the participants in the room, if just for a few seconds. Hmm. No, Stu cannot hear you. We can do this, we can do this. Perhaps while we are waiting to sort out the audio issues, let's just turn over to William in the meantime, if that's okay, and we'll get back to you, Wynn. Okay, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, go ahead. So I was wondering, you talk about um, decentralization of the internet and um, how this is one of the major uh, factors on, on why it has been, it's been able to scale in such a way. Um, yet on an application level, we see an, an increased uh, centralization um, of ma major technical uh, players. Um, I was wondering, did you by chance look into how the centralization of, of gatekeepers, for example, may affect the decentralization um, on a technical level as well, uh, such as regarding which technologies are adopted and um, perhaps how this may affect scalability in the future? Yes, perhaps I can try to, to answer that. And, uh, it's a very good question. Thank you for that. Uh, we did um, we did spend um, quite a bit of time uh, in the work with this on discussing these uh, these issues. Uh, we have also uh, reflected a little bit on it in the um, in the final section of the report. Uh, I think you are right that uh, that there is such a uh, such a trend and there is this. Uh, um, as, as you put it, centralization at the application layer. Um, and of course, that that influences uh, the internet. Um, now, as we see it, we have we have not so far seen um, a development where where that has has slowed down or has has limited the availability or the access to the to the internet uh, as such. Um, we have seen that these uh, lo very large internet players they have taken a um, a role in the further development of the internet, uh, as you as you yourself mentioned, they are active in developing new protocols. Quick, as was mentioned here earlier, is one example of a protocol that was originally uh, developed by one of these very by Google by one of these very large players. Um, and and uh, uh, of course, there is uh, uh, there is. Um, uh, a risk, perhaps, that uh, that as a lot of the traffic in the internet moves internally into these very large networks, they can adopt different protocols, different ways of doing things internally in their networks, and that that would somehow, um, you know, contribute to uh, a separation of of what is the public internet and what is internal networks. Um, you can always speculate about these things. So far, we have not really seen that happening as far as we can see, but, uh, but we'd be interested, of course, to hear any other views on that. Paul has his end up. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I, I would uh, just comment that the, the uh, permissive environment of the internet, which allows the permissionless innovation can allow things to layer on top of the internet that start to look like they might in themselves break uh, internet principles for what we would really need to worry about is whether that becomes the default or whether that influences the way the internet itself works. I mean, we heard a lot until about 2019, we heard a lot about the, the death of peering uh, being something that would, um, or the death of transit, sorry, as, uh, as an emergent trend, which, uh, which comes from the, uh, the proliferation of CDNs and so forth, getting in the way of of and making transit connections redundant, but uh, COVID has, has shown us that transit and and end to end connectivity is is uh, is, is absolutely as strong as it uh, was ever intended to be because uh, because we're all we're all using it now and across the world uh, peer to peer end to end end to end communications has had this incredible resurgence. So the bad thing would be if the if the apparent death of um, of transit had actually resulted in the death of end to end. 
then that would be where one of those sort of apparent behaviors actually does affect the infrastructure. But it's an example of, of it's an example where it hasn't done. So again, the centralization of Facebook, for instance, doesn't necessarily mean anything uh, in a technical sense for the centralization of other services on the internet. Or if it, if it does, that's what we should be probably, probably talking about. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And also, I think you have a comment and then we'll get to Wim. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Joyce. A couple of comments here. We aim to look for technical uh, decisions and uh, how the technical um, developments have made the internet success. So we've become aware that uh, if we ever need to fix something, um, we don't change uh, in, in a non-conscious way these fundamentals. So of course, there are many elements, commercial, social, economical, elements that may be uh, uh, relevant of this uh, for this success but those uh, are, uh, are not part of this original design and and this is what we uh, hear very uh, uh, um, very often that uh, let's try to come up with this new technical standard whether those are countries whether those are companies uh, so uh, uh, the, the, trying to uh, answer the, um, the, the question by, made by Wim, um, he will made it uh, in a couple of seconds, but uh, let, let me jump ahead. Uh, I think th this is the first stage, the, the first stage of future um, um, uh, challenges. We need to make people aware of uh, these fundamentals so we don't mess with those uh, in the future, uh, whether this is for political reasons or this is for trying to fix uh, current uh, challenges to the internet technical um, uh, capabilities. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar, and thanks, Wim, for your patience. Let's get to your question now. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, it's it's pretty weird to ask a question when uh, just heard the, the answer. So uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, but first of all, hi from uh, from Katowice. It's uh, really great to uh, to sit in this meeting. It's a pity for everybody online that you're not here because the experience of uh, this hybrid is completely different than what you would expect from being used in a normal meeting with remote participation. But uh, uh, second, uh, congratulations for the study because I think it's very clear and, and put in very clear terms, explains the success. Um, and that brings me also to, um, to my question. Um, well, what now, what are now the biggest threats um, you, you see to, um, that could make that this evolution, this continuous growth, the success of the internet uh, will not continue? Uh, I think one, Answer is already given by um, by Oscar, and and I think I fully agree that probably one uh, of the threats is that there is not the under understanding of how it actually works, uh, how resilient it is, and that based on that there is not sufficient trust. And if there is not sufficient trust in how things work, people will look for other solutions. But uh, do you see other um, risks or, or threats uh, we need to uh, well look out for and, and try to answer? Thank you. Yeah, this is Armand. Per perhaps I can just start off with one, and please others uh, <laughs> join me as well. Because in this uh, this area, of course, I think uh, uh, everyone has thoughts to to contribute. But one such issue, I mean, we have we have seen that the, the internet works works well. It scales. We don't see a, a collapse in scalability. Um, we don't see a collapse in these other dimensions that we have um, discussed. Of course, there are. And uh, there is the, the, um, the issue of safe use of the internet for all. I mean, how to keep the internet as a, as a, as a place where, um, where, it's, where it's safe to be and where, where, it's, uh, where, where, where people should have um, um, uh, the ability to access uh, information openly and freely, but also to be uh, not put in harm's way. Um, I'm thinking of all the and the economy that is moved to the internet and all the attacks, all the threats that are coming from there. And in, in response to all these, these threats, of course, uh, since the internet has become so important, uh, governments also take a, a legitimate interest in the internet and in ways to regulate it and to, to, to keep their citizens safe and, to, uh, and to, 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 to shield them from harm. So 
Um, so, so this kind of this balance between this, uh, uh, in some cases at least, legitimate uh, uh, need from from the governments and and then the openness of the internet, because because as the as the governments. Um, try to, to make their influence, uh, to, to have their jurisdiction also in the, in the internet domain. Of course, the risk is that they will, they will, they will be too strong, basically. They will, they, will, they, will do, uh, they will take measures that are unproportional uh, and that, that kind of limits the openness and, and, and availability that has been so central to the internet's uh, success. Uh, so, so recognizing this uh, at least sometimes legitimate uh, requirement of a government to have some saying in this, uh, whereas on the other side, keeping this openness and, and, and distributed nature the, and the, um, the multi-stakeholder model of the internet, uh, that is at least uh, important, I think. Thanks, Hammond, for your answer. Do you have any follow-up questions or comments, Wim? Uh, no, thank you. Thanks very much and lovely to have you in Katowice. So I'm just mindful of time. Oh, sorry, Oscar, go ahead. I'm mute. You're muted. A comment, uh, if you're interested in these uh, other challenges, uh, uh, at the last uh, in the last part of this uh, story, um, we have mentioned some of this of those uh, challenges. Um, uh, centralization is, of course, one of the things that we've uh, seen as a uh, challenge to these fundamentals. So uh, uh, make sure to uh, uh, read those uh, ideas. Uh, probably you have a, a several others, but uh, those. Uh, are the ones that we believe are the most uh, relevant challenge in the near future. Thanks, Oscar. So just to round up um, this section of the q and I do have one last question to our three um, special guests from Analysis Mason, which is, you know, during the course of your doing the research for the study, um, and, and knowing that a lot of the factors that have been brought up today isn't really something new or, you know, groundbreaking in that sense, did you learn anything that was new or surprising to you as you were conducting this study? I think for myself, I mean, certainly we, we had a, a multidisciplinary team. Amund is, uh, is more on the technical side. I'm an economist. So I think we learned from each other to take a full view. But I think the real advantage was to put all the pieces together. Um, to start from, you know, the beginning, the guiding ideals, and we had the privilege of talking to some of the founders and uh, Steve Crocker and uh, Vince Cerf to really get a, you know, an amazing view of, of, of their views at the beginning that, that, that we in, incorporated into the three guiding ideals, taking that through these design principles into the success factors. I think that for me anyway, was the, the real learning of bringing all of those points together and thinking about some of the future threats um, that we, um, you know, that we just, uh, that Ahmed just spoke about. Yeah, just perhaps to second uh, that, uh, Michael, one kind of personal experience for me from, <laughs> from, from doing this, I have a background in, in networking research in, uh, in academia. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus, was at least 10 years ago when I was still active in that area, a lot of focus on, you know, um, uh, new architectures, you know, more kind of radical proposals, novelty, things have to be, be new. We don't have to rest, we can't rest on past success, we need to do new things. So for me, this study has kind of been a, kind of an eye opener on that. Well, there is, there is a significant value in how things are working today. Uh, of course, we should keep innovating, we should, we should keep developing and, and proposing new solutions. Um, but, but there is also some value in, 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 in stepping back and looking at what has made this a success, uh, and, and that that can kind of guide uh, new uh, proposals for, for, for novel uh, innovations on the internet that uh, at least make sure not to, to destroy what is already very valuable. 
That's great, Michael and uh, Armand. I don't know if Julia would like to share any thoughts, whether you found anything new or surprising for yourself as you know you went through this journey of conducting the research. Um, I mean, I'm much newer to <laughs> researching the internet than Armand and Michael both are. Um, so I found a lot of it was quite novel to me, um, but all very interesting, uh, certainly. Thanks very much to all three of you. Now, in our last few minutes before I close the session, I would like you to go back to menti.com. Uh, I will share the link in just a short bit, but give me a second to share my screen. Here we go. So go to menti.com and use the code 42177963. And then answer the question, how do you see the future of the internet? What do you think it would look like? I think that's a great way to end the session and, and to think about um, how we have the eye on the future. And I think there will also some discussion around this as well. So we'd love to hear your thoughts around this. So go to menti.com, use the code 42177963. So we see the answers slowly coming in as people look into their crystal balls. Somebody has put in Walt Gardens. I think that's something we are already beginning to see um, and that we might be able to project into the future. Lots of small local secure internets. Inclusive, I like that. Hopefully we will continue to be more inclusive and more diverse. The internet will continue to evolve to fit the new needs addressing new challenges. And I think it is very well equipped to do that, as we've heard from today. More accessibility in rural areas. I think that is work that is already being done and it will continue to happen. I don't know if any of you see at one point, perhaps, you know, one day we will have everybody who is connected online. So. I'm just going to, oops, sorry. Right, I'm going to scroll down and see what the other answers are. Future of the internet is promising if it remains open. I like the optimism. More logical centralization of key architectural functions. At the same time, increased topological decentralization of their deployed realization. I see some people who are seeing more and more centralization, you know, more walled off networks. But then yet at the same time, I see some people who are also feeling that it's more positive. We can always work towards being more open. Interesting comment that we're only halfway, lots of innovations, but hopefully still open for everyone. And it's true, you know, there are always surprises, you know, it used to be once every few years, but we're looking at once every few months cycle now and even faster, I think. So there will always be new surprises coming up from the internet. Still resilient, interoperable, global, unfractured, secure. IPv6 only, yes, let's aim for IPv6 only future. So I thank all of you for your participation in today's session. Um, you can continue to put your answers in and we will continue to collate them as they come in. I also want to have a special thanks for Emin, for Michael, for Julia for joining us today, as well as Oscar and Paul for giving the opening remarks. And of course, thank you to, your, to all of you for your engagement, your participation. It's not very easy because we're in a hybrid mode, but I do hope that you find the study meaningful. Uh, I will put the link again to the study in the chat, and I hope that you will take some time to read the study and to go through the points. We would love to have your comments and your feedback, so do stay in touch. Thank you, everybody.